Thank you guys so much for, um, for being here. My name is Jessica Shaw. I'm so happy. I love this show. Rabbit Hole uh, premieres on Paramount Plus on March 26th with the two you just saw. And um, I'm so thrilled to be here with this wonderful panel. Kiefer Sutherland, who plays John Weir. Thank you. Maida Golding, who plays Haley. Hi. Enid Graham, Joe, and creator John Requa. Welcome. So, Kiefer, what was the pitch? What got you? What got you about this character? It, it, it was, in all fairness, it, it was pretty simple. Uh, John and Glenn, uh, got, we got on the phone together, and they said we really wanted to do something that was going to harken back to the 70s thrillers. Um, and we were, they were talking, they were throwing out names like Three Days of the Condor, The Parallax View, uh, even The Game at one point, uh, Marathon Man. All the President's Men, and these were all the films that I had grown up on. These were the films that one day I hoped, as an actor, I would be able to make a film like that. Mm -hmm. And so I got very excited, uh, and, and, and the, genre, the genre of the thriller uh, hasn't really changed from the beginning of film. Uh, it's basically take your character's life, turn it upside down, kick him to the street, and then say, run for your life. And, uh, and so... <laughs> We, we discovered that part quite quickly, and then they started talking about this world that they wanted it to be in, which was very contemporary, which was using this technical, technological revolution that we're going through as a backdrop, and how quickly uh, your own personal information can be taken from you and then used against you. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that was just fascinating, uh, because it's something that you know, I'm aware of certainly because I watch the news, but I'm aware of watching how my children and my grandchildren are deeply affected uh, by social media and, and the things that are changing literally weekly mm -hmm. uh, on a technological level. So uh, that, that was the pitch, except they did it more concise, and it was a pretty quick phone call. Well, John, tell I mean, tell us. I mean, I it's you mentioned Three Days of the Condor. Amazing movie, Marathon Man. I mean, all of these things as I was watching the show that I thought about as well, and I know that these 70s films were a huge influence. What, how did this, this world uh, come to you? Actually, it started, we heard that Kiefer was looking for something. And, then <laughs> <laughs> and we, we, we share an agent, and we, and, and we said, uh, well, we've always wanted to go into this world. We love those movies, and we felt like they were being underserviced. Uh, that that audiences love these movies. They don't, but they don't make the movies anymore because you know it's all tent poles and guys in tights. So uh, we get that, and so but we're like, well, let's make that. But but we said, what if you were doing a movie about deception, and your lead were was Kiefer Sutherland, who everybody loves and trusts. You know what I mean? And and so you could you could. Fuck with, let's see, I said it, it happened already. <laughs> her, ki her kids are here. I said, I won't use the F word. It already <laughs> happened. But I, you can mess with people's minds. So, because because they trust him. They love him. They're with him. And so you can just pull the rug. And, and that's what this show is about, is pulling the rug. And those movies were about pulling the rug. Okay, what's everyone's favorite 70s thriller then? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, kind of cop out here, but I actually mean it. Mine was actually a film that my father was in called Don't Look Now, uh, directed by Nick Rogue. So, uh, yeah. Good one, not a cop out. Um, Oops. <laughs> Say Don't Look Now. <laughs> don't, don't, you, the same thing that Kiefer said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go with Maida. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think it's Condor, I guess it's Condor. Condor. Three Days of yeah. the Condor. I mean, and this this show is Condor. Movie. I mean, you know the, you know, Maida is Faye Dunaway, and you know, I mean, it's all that's all taken from that. Yeah. yeah. Maida, tell me about about figuring out your character because as we're watching it, you're you're thinking, okay, she is she good? Is she bad? What's this back and forth? How much did you want to know about her? And obviously you find out more as this, as this season goes on versus like, you know, just give me little bits of information. Um, well, that's what I liked about it is that 
I didn't know or that it that she was very complicated, that she wasn't, she's not all good and she's not all bad or uh, she's a human being, but in this genre, it is a twist and turn. And, you know, I had conversations. I mean, I remember <laughs> when I first met John and Glenn, who's not here, um, I was like, but wait, wait, wait a second, you know, is, I, like, is she a spy? What, is she good? Is she bad? And they were like, ah, oh, well, ah. Uh. Um, and we sort of had lots of conversations and, you know, I don't want to give it away. Um, don't. <laughs> But that was that was what was that was the challenge and the beauty is that there were so many layers to this character. Um, Enid, uh, um, John has said that Joe is one of two kind of what you see is what you get characters on this show, and is that a relief for you or are you like I want to have like be duplicitous and, and, you know, have all of these other things going on? Well, uh, I don't know. I, as soon as I read the first episode and read Joe, the part of Joe, I, I was like, oh, I get it. I mean, I just love this lady. You know, she's tough. She's, um, like, ambitious, and she says exactly what she thinks. <laughs> she's a mom, but not in a typical way. And uh, all of that really appealed to me. Um, I think there's plenty of twists and turns in the story, so I'm happy to um, be be a, a person that you can count on. Question mark. <laughs> Kiefer, is John trustworthy? Like, well, how do you approach that? Well, I mean, not that's me. A your question. character. You could, you, you, could, <laughs> you could ask about about any single person, and and I, I think on some level. We're all duplicitous uh, to some degree. Um, but it, that, that's in all fairness, that, that's a question for the audience and it's something that they have to watch the entire show for. I, I think one of the things about using this idea of deception as a backdrop and, and whether that deception is being used for a greater good or a greater evil is, is something that will unfold as we're telling the story. Um, and, and it doesn't change how I'm going to approach the character. Uh, because I have, I you know, obviously, I have, I have insight to to where the story is going through John and Glenn in a way that uh, that allows me to do my job, and 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 so the thing that we're excited about now is that we finally get to to present it, yeah. uh, and and I can't wait for all eight episodes to come out so uh, people can go kind of down the road that these guys have built for us, and and so we'll see. I, I was, what you said in earlier was actually one of my questions, and I was curious how you felt about this. I think audiences have a, or feel that they have a relationship with on-screen Kiefer Sutherland, that, that you are you are Jack Bauer, that you are this care, this trustworthy person. And I, I think on some level, when you play this character and you don't know who it is and the audience has very used to seeing you mm -hmm. in a certain role, it's playing an, another layer of a mind game with the audience watching the show where you're playing mind games. Well, I, I'll tell you a very quick story. I, I was sitting on a plane, uh, I think it was about the sixth or seventh season of 24, and, and I, I walked down the aisle and I sat in my seat and I sat next to a woman who, who had her glass of wine already in her hand and she looked like a nervous flyer. And she looked at me and she said, oh, thank God, now I feel safe. <laughs> and I, I said, why? Everybody who sat next to me for the last eight years in my show is dead. <laughs> and I've never seen anybody take a whole glass of wine and shoot it. Um, so, whatever people have put on me as a result of the character of Jack Bauer uh, might not be fair, I guess, is what I'm getting to. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and hopefully, I, look, I, I, in all fairness, I think the genres are very similar and, and they are the same. Um, but the characters are dynamically different. Jack Bauer is the guy who runs into a fight and John Weir is the guy trying to figure out how to run away from one. Um, the only time Jack Bauer uh, ever smiled 
in 24 was when he killed Nina Myers, you know. The <laughs> John Weir has a sense of humor and, and you know, uh, a reluctant love. Um, so yeah, they're just dynamically different characters and, and, uh, and, and I think certainly from the reaction that I've seen uh, in the few screenings that we've had, people are more than willing to kind of accept that. Um, you brought up that he has a sense of humor. Um, Keeper, you and Mesa are so funny, um, especially I think in the second episode. They just Thanks, play John. off each other Thank you. so well. The two of you are like s uh, really fun kind of comedic partners. Was that something that, that came naturally? Was that something that you wrote to you were like, this guy's funny, he plays all these dramatic roles, give him some humor. He, he, they did not write it to, to any kind of concept of knowing me at all. These are two of the greatest comedic writers. I mean, Bad Santa in All Fairness is one of my favorite sc screenplays of the last 25 years. <laughs> um, it's, they wrote stuff that was so delicately funny too that, that and, and actually, I mean, no one's knocked down my door to do a comedy, and uh, let's just be honest about that. <laughs> um, and and Maida has such beautiful comedic timing. Aww, uh, and the first thing that she kind of taught me was that you don't really want to lean into these jokes because they're really delicate. Um, and so, yeah, I, I was nervous, um, but you couldn't have asked for a better dance partner. And these guys just wrote such beautiful dialogue. Aww. I told him to say all that. <laughs> um, yeah, no, the the script itself was was you know was there. The, it was the very word, well written. It was it was well written, you know, but also it's like you know working with keepers like going into a really intense tennis match, like you know he just throws it at you a million percent, and you got to throw it back, otherwise you're out. So I think it, it's that sort of tension. Like, we didn't really, because we just kind of, hi, nice to meet you, bam, you know, and just went at it. And I don't know, sometimes you just fight good with certain people, you know? It, it also doesn't hurt if the first scene you ever do together is a guy explaining to a girl that she has to be a spy because there's no way someone that good looking would ever be with me. <laughs> like, inherently, <laughs> that kind of lends itself to having a laugh. Was the chemistry pretty immediate? I mean, did when you saw them on screen together, the first in that first scene, where you're like, "Oh, phew." Yeah, yeah. It was like, yeah. I mean, well, no, we we did uh, a what they call a chemistry read. Yeah. Uh, we did auditions, and then we yeah, did we went like, through the know, audition process. Yeah, yeah. And we yeah. and we and they were we put them in a room together, and it was like, okay, well, it was easy. <laughs> it, it was actually during COVID, so it was my first in-person live audition in a couple of years. So I, when I went in, I was like, oh my God, this is so exciting to be in a room or I'm, I forgot how to do this. And, um, and it was really, you know, obviously it, it went well, um, <laughs> but, but it was fun and it was in, we still, I think I had to get tested to do the audition. Yeah. yeah. Twice. <laughs> yeah, twice, yeah. Ba -bum -bum. yeah. <laughs> He's a really good writer. Enid, I need a whole other like second show about her home life because I like, did you screen test with your phone? Like talking to, you, you know what I mean? I just, I don't, I don't know what's going on there. I relate to it. Um, there's, there's def are we gonna learn more about that? Yeah, well, thank you. That was one of the things that really drew me to it. I was like, okay, wait a minute. It's it's take your daughter to work week, but you're an FBI agent and your daughter <laughs> has to go with you on like, you know, uh, scouting missions on the, you know, she's in the she's in the car while you break into someone's home. Like, I love it. And um, I'm also a mom, and my kids are out there somewhere watching us. Hello, kiddos. <laughs> but um, I, uh, I totally related to that, and I just loved that, that um, you know, it was this working mother who was, who was passionate about her job and passionate about her home life. And, you know, I don't know, I guess it reminded me of me a little bit. <laughs> and um, so I, I love that John and Glenn put that on the screen. Um, yeah, are you going to learn more? I guess you just have to watch and see. But thank you for the question. 
John, you and, you and Glenn are no, you guys love a reveal and you like sort of pulling the rug out. Like I think about, you know, the This Is Us pilot or Crazy Stupid Love, one of my favorites. And um, I love the keepers like Bad Santa and I'm like Crazy Stupid Love. Um, <laughs> but um, what, how do you balance that with, you know, we're gonna have people that are like, maybe not what they seem, not what you know, and then versus we need to have some element of trust that the audience can count on. Well, I, I, th I think uh, audiences wanna feel like they're in someone's hands. They wanna feel like they're on a journey and they're in, in the hands of a storyteller that they're comfortable with. You know, I, 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 there are filmmakers out there and we all know them who, who when you watch their movie, you're like, I don't know what the f they're gonna do. Who, I mean, who knows? You know, it's like you've, there's a volatility there. But that's not what I what we aim to do. We want people to say like, we're gonna lie to you, okay? <laughs> we're, we're gonna lie to you, but it's gonna be a great lie because we're we're trying to deceive you. We're trying to pull your perception and your preconceived notions of where story and characters are going, and then we're gonna try to reverse you, yeah. and then and that's gonna be fun, and that's gonna be delicious and uh, it's not but it's not going to be dishonest it's not going to be deception it's going to be fun it's going to be a full meal that's that's what we that from the very beginning of our career that's what we always wanted to do i mean let's just talk about the last like scene of of episode two and the the when we see charles dance um and what was that like filming that scene because that was i mean i feel like i've seen every tv show on the planet and i was still i was like oh Oh, okay. It got me. Those are the those are the scenes for me that are the scariest to shoot because when you read them on the page, they have the same effect. Uh, you think, oh my gosh, that's really clever and that's frightening, and and then you imagine Charlie Dance doing it, and it, 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 you know you times all of that by ten. Uh, so I think I remember that was the first scene that I would constantly go back to John and Glenn as directors and just say. Was that right? Did it did it work? Did it work? And they're like, Yeah, no, it really worked. Do it again, and and <laughs> and um, because there's there's no worse feeling than kind of knowing a moment's potential and not hitting it. Uh, it's it's always exciting, kind of creating a moment when you didn't expect it, but not fulfilling a possibility uh, is is really frightening. And they write so many possibilities that that going to work actually in the morning is quite a fearful proposition. Um, but they're, they're so special about guiding you kind of to the finish line. But that was my experience with it. It's interesting because this show feels um, like it's coming out at such an interesting time in the world right now. Like people, you know, there's a, a spectrum and there's some people have a healthy distrust of corporations and then some people are like QAnon. You know, and I was curious how how you feel this show kind of fits into that spectrum, and if if being on this show as actors or writing it has has moved you one way or the other, or has it made you think about this this world? <laughs> we feel like there is a something bigger happening than. Uh, there's a lot of tension between the left and the right right now, and we pay a lot of attention to it. And, but I think there's something else happening that's affecting us all, and actually it unites us, which is we are surrendering, surrendering ourselves uh, every day when we go online, and we don't even think about it. Mm -hmm. And that's what this show's about, ultimately, is that, is that exposure, you know, and, and, the, and how we are all vulnerable, and we're, you know, arguing with each other about things, and, and we're and we're not agreeing, but we're all victims. We're all united by our victimness, victimhood. <laughs> you know? yeah. It's all about data and algorithms, and you know, you can't go anywhere without using your cell phone even to look at a menu, and so it just seems so timely, and especially I think the isolation of the pandemic so. Many people, me included, I'd spent hours on YouTube, you know, going down one conspiracy theory after another, and then just this separation and different news sources. And I mean, who can you trust, literally? And I think we all 
feel that way. And, and I think it's also individually, like who can you trust? Who, as a person, you know, the, do you know the people you're with, really? So it just, it, it really spoke to what was going on. Yeah, I mean, was the, was, did that give you like this underlying, I don't know, tension or anxiety, <laughs> like when you would wrap a day, you know, you'd finish shooting for a day and then it's like, oh my God, my brain is like spiraling out about this? It's hard for me to separate my general anxiety with my, <laughs> with my rabbit hole induced anxiety. I think that they, they run a pretty tight race together. <laughs> yeah. Um, I understand there's a lot of Easter eggs that are gonna, um, that there will be payoff later. Like, are there things in these two episodes that we all just saw that we should be paying attention to? Yes. <laughs> okay. All of it. And, and, and uh, this story is a complete story. This season is a complete story. There's an open window for another season and, and seasons going forward, but it's a, it's a movie. It's an eight-part movie. You will be satisfied. All your questions will be answered. <laughs> we promise. And you will want more, hopefully. I'm gonna go to a few audience questions um, for Kiefer. Compared to other roles you played, what can people expect from John Weir? Well, I think uh, a level of complexity. Um, you know, and you have to understand, I, I loved 24, and I loved playing Jack Bauer, and I loved that 10 years of my life, and it was one of the greatest experiences that I've had in my career. But Jack Bauer as a character was a blunt instrument, and John Weir is a surgeon scalpel. Uh, he's intellectually driven, uh, but but and, and incredibly confident. He, he has he has this ability with numbers to create prob you know to forecast probabilities. But he suffers from huge self confidence issues, verging on neurosis. Um, so just that's that's a hundred and eighty degree shift. That those. You know, he's falling in love with someone he knows he shouldn't be falling in love with, and there's another conflict. And so, and there's one after another, the father-son issues and everything compiling against each other. So it's an incredibly layered character, uh, and, and, and I think it makes it him incredibly human. Uh, and so for his shortcomings and his failures, there will be a level of understanding. Uh, and for his strengths and his victories, uh, there will be genuine, uh, excitement and 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 so i think as complicated as the character is uh and makes it a joy to play i hope it will be and translate as a joy to watch so i i, I just think it's a very unique opportunity for me and a very different character um and and for enid and meta how have how have your roles differed from things that you've done with past roles um well for me, I think Haley is, um, you know, I, sh she's not, I mean, I, I, I don't want to talk bad about my other characters. It's kind of like what Kiefer was saying, because um, I've, you know, enjoyed playing lots of different types of women. But I, I think I said this before, it was great that she gets to be a full human being and she gets to be angry and smart and like funny and fall in love or try to or try to date or uh, you know it's it just a uh, I, I get to do action in this I mean they really it, it was a lot it was a you know it's so it's kind of what we we say multi-tonal you know there's um, lots of different genres in this piece and I would say that there are lots of different genres in Haley and that was what was great about playing her uh, yeah, for me, um, I I think it was just fun not to have to be so sad. <laughs> I feel like I feel like usually my the roles that I get, I've been lucky to get some really great parts in in TV and film, but often they're very very sad. And I was thumbing through the script, and I was like, I don't have to go to the morgue. I don't have to ID my child, you know. So <laughs> I was really it was so fun to be in a thriller and to, to be involved in like 
you know, this kind of twisty, turny story and to be, you know, a cop, a FBI agent trying to, you know, get to the bottom of it, you know, it, it's just really fun to go to work. And so, anyway, thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Um, for John, how has technology and social media impacted your and Glenn's creative process for the series? Well, I, I don't think we would have made this, I mean, the, the story arc of this show if it wasn't for how technology has, you know, just come into our lives. And are we ready? I mean, it came stampeding into all of our lives, like at a million miles an hour, and just dominated us. All of us, the whole human race. And are we ready? I mean, that's really what this show's about. It's like, are we ready? Are we ready for this? I mean, it's not a, it's not a deep show. It's not going to school. It's, <laughs> but it's, it's a fun show, but it really is examining that, you know, technology has come, I mean, you know, look at what's going on with the AI right now, yeah. you know? And, and, and my, you know, I get an email uh, from the, my son's school. It's like, we know how to tell if it's chat GB, you know, what is it, <laughs> the chat AI thing. And we're like, that's we're, a lie. They don't uh, know. And we know, so tell your kids that they can't do AI for their assignments. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, come on. I, and so like education is, the whole concept of education is up, up, it's up in the air right now. I mean, my son's, I have a 15 year old. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. So, and we've been, and this is like, you know, it's been 25 years of this. And so it's gonna, it's gonna continue. And we have to find a way to digest this and, 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 and make sense of it and, you know. So that's what the show sort of is about at, at its core. Did you find you, were you and Glenn like constantly kind of digging of, of things online of like, oh, this is something that we should tap into. This is something we should talk about. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard because, you know, in, when you do entertainment, when you do like drama, you're, you're trying, you elevate things. You, you take reality and you kind of turn it up a couple of clicks to make it, you know, and it's like, you know, we, we would turn it up a couple of clicks and then the headlines would come out and say like, well, no, that's reality now. And so, I mean, that, I mean it was really, it really is, you know, it, it, was, it was hard, you know, it was hard to find the way, like, to make it sensational and dramatic, uh, you know, because and, and, that's what you need. You need this sort of polarization of drama, you know. And so, yeah, it was, it was a challenge because the world is just so screwed up right now. Sure. Do you have a kind of Bible of these characters and of this world? And I know you said that season one ends and it's a, it closes a loop, but seeing as this could go many seasons, you know, hopefully, do you sort of have your end game in mind? Uh, not really, because we, we really feel like what we were doing in this season is building a team um, who can deal with the unique circumstance of our modern world. Um, and, and they're able to then to address different problems. But the problems will always be internal and external. You know, the whole thing about this show is that all of the external problems are also internal problems. They're, they're like character-based problems. Because that's just, we tell character stories. We don't tell plot-driven stories. We tell character stories, so like every, journey of every season, if we're so lucky to go forward, will be, you know, characters dealing with their past and their future and their present at the same time. You know, I mean, that, that's just what we're interested in. Those are the stories we're interested in telling. For the three of you, how much did you want to know going into it? Were you like, tell me, tell me where I am this season? Or did you sort of like not having all of the information? For me, information is key. I'll take everything I can get. Yeah. Um, I prefer information, but I, when I first got the scripts, I only got the first, I think we got the first four, but I heard the voice of the character. Mm -hmm. So as long as I kind of know the character, then I can I can go with whatever happens. But I knew it was twisty turny and there were lots of I mean, information is wonderful, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I felt like I understood 
Joe Maddie right away and, and that she was really well written. And so then I was sort of like, she can go any, you know, where do you want to take her? I knew that these guys would take her someplace that would be believable, but, but, but it might be surprising. So I didn't mind not knowing the end because I felt like, as Maida said, that I, that I knew the, the woman. So since we're in New York, I got to ask, <clears throat> what was the biggest challenge to Toronto being New York City? <laughs> <laughs> the biggest challenge is that it was Toronto <laughs> and not no, New no. York City. No, no, Kiefer, I got a better answer. The CN Tower. It's in every shot. You know the CN, the CN Tower, that Space Needle thing? I'm from Seattle. The Space Needle thing. <laughs> and that thing is like wherever you shoot in Toronto. It's in, you could shoot in the basement in Toronto and the CN Tower. <laughs> you have to paint it out. You have to put a budget line to paint it out. Yeah. But no, I, we were glad to be there. I mean, it's a great place, but it's it's a it's a lovely town and and uh, and Kiefer's hometown. Yeah. So he's yeah. a hometown boy. So we were glad to be there. But yeah, uh, yeah we love it there. Well, um, I love the show. The, uh, Rabbit Hole's great. It premieres this Sunday, March 26th, on Paramount Plus um, with two episodes and then episodes every week. So you've gotten to see the first two and. Um, I can't wait to see more, and I know these guys can't wait to see more. Thank you. Thank you guys so thank much. This panel thank so thank much, you. and thank all of you so much for coming. Thank, thank you, you guys.